Welcome back to Kazakhstan and its capital, Astana. The past six days has seen the city place itself at the centre of the international sporting world as it played host to the 2015 World Judo Championships. The International Judo Federation's flagship event cast Astana in the centre of an intense media spotlight as dreams came true and were shattered when world titles were won and lost inside the Alao Ice Palace. Now it's time for what many consider to be judo's most exciting spectacle, the World Team Championships, which will see the top judo nations battle it out for the top spot. The team event adds a whole new dynamic to the individual sport of judo, as a nation selects a team of five before being pitted against another nation in a race to three wins. Let's use last year's thrilling final in Chelyabinsk as an example. Japan faced Russia on home turf, and in the opening contest, reigning world champion Ebonuma is thrown for Ippon by Khan Magmadov. The stadium erupts as Russia take a 1-0 lead. The home nation then go 2-0 up after Ayatsev defeats Ono, making it effectively match point in the next contest. The Russians are now tantalisingly close to the gold. But Japan starts a heroic comeback. Nagase throws Kabacharov for Ippon to make it 2-1. Baker then throws Magomedov for Yuko before keeping him in an agonising 20-second pin to level things up at two apiece. The match and the World Championship title is ultimately decided when Shishinui pins Kambiev to complete the comeback as Japan are crowned World Team Champions. The special value of the team event and the hopes for its future are explained by International Judo Federation President Mr Marius Visser. The team event, I think, is uh, one of the most attractive events in the judo sport. Uh, we hope to uh, have the chance to uh, put the application for the team event in Tokyo. And everybody is waiting and supporting this initiative. One nation who would be on the hunt for a first world team title would be Mongolia, who have a strong team entered in both the women's and the men's event. Mongolia is still a sparsely populated nation, characterised by beautiful rugged wilderness in which many of its inhabitants live in a traditional nomadic way, unchanged for generations. The country's biggest annual sporting festival, Nadam, sees participants and spectators coming from all over the country to unite in friendly rivalry as they contest traditional sports including horse riding, archery and of course traditional Mongolian wrestling. This unique style of wrestling is practiced by all young Mongolians, both male and female, giving them a fantastic grounding in grappling sports. And one which has proven integral to Mongolia's favorite international sport, judo. National team members, uh, most of them, almost like 80-90% of the judokas uh, came from uh, countryside, which is the still nomadic way background so this is a very great opportunity for them make a more friend and travel all around the world showing the unity showing the performance skill and make our world more richer the national judo team is made up mostly from nomadic stock all of whom began their training wrestling on the plains before applying their skills to the judo mat the mongolian judo association has partnered with the ijf to spread the sport across the nation in the hopes of producing many more future stars, making it Mongolia's most loved global sport. This synergy has also helped to bring Mongolia and its culture to the wider world, as for three years, the capital Ulaanbaatar has hosted the annual Chinggis Khan Grand Prix, an important event on the IGF World Tour, which is broadcast worldwide, making it the only event staged in Mongolia to be viewed by an international audience. In 2000, 13, we made the first Mongolian uh, broadcast from Mongolia all around the world. This was the first ever coverage ever made from Mongolia to the world. So this is also a good opportunity for Mongolians uh, to show to the world the uh, Mongolian uh, lifestyle. First up in the quest for medals were the Mongolian women's team. Last year's bronze medalists had a squad filled with world judo superstars, including Mongolia's first ever female world champion, Monkbat, 
It also included two bronze medal winners from the week's individual competition. One of which produced a great hip on, judo's knockout equivalent, in the team's opening encounter with hosts Kazakhstan. A feat matched by Sendayush at under 70 kilograms as Mongolia sailed through with a 5 0 win. After breaking the hearts of Korea's women, it was time for a showdown with hot favourites Japan in the semi final. It would prove difficult viewing for Mongolia's fans and the fighters on the sidelines. After world champion Nakamura passed the bat on to Yamamoto, Japan was soon 2 0 up. In a cruel moment for Sedef Siren, she was then pinned by Toshiro to give the Japanese victory and relegate Mongolia to the fight for bronze. Their dreams of a first world title were in pieces. To rub salt into the wound, Japan refused to allow any consolation victories as Arai and then Yamabe completed a whitewash to progress to the final. A deflated Mongolia would have to ready themselves for Germany in the bronze medal match. First up at under 52 kilograms, Monkbat versus world number eight, Cray. Your commentator is former British world champion, Neil Adams. So important to get the first score on the board. First contest, very important. Left against right. Oh, Monkbat's gone over, over Uma. And you don't very often see that with Monkbat. Right the way over the top there. Oguruma, what a nip on, and the Germans are what ahead. Beautiful Oguruma, amazing technique from Cray. George Shiren showed her class in the next match with Roper to level things up going into the under 63 kilograms contest. Sedev Shiren will have to stop that big arm coming over the top. Ooh, tries the Makikomi. Now what's she gonna do? Sienagi's what she's gonna do! What a brilliant Sienagi! That puts Mongolia 2-1 up then. Really takes advantage of that arm over the top, controls the arm. Look at the rotation and the determination on her face. And she just rotates her over. What a win. As Diedrich took on Sendayush, Mongolia were only one win away from the bronze. For those at the side of the tatami, it was torture. Well, can Diedrich equal this all up? Oh, Uchigari, oh, she's counted a rip arm! What a time to do it! It's 2-2! Two -two. And Meltzan, well, she knows it's down to her now. Look at this Tewaza! Oh, it was hand assisted all the way over. What an important point to win. So, for Mongolia, it all came down to Odku, as she took on Malzan in the decider. Shido there to Odku. She's got to come forwards. Mount Sad. Can she do it for Germany? Oh, so to Gary! Was Ari given? Was Ari given and it's been changed to a Yuko? So now Mount Sad got to come back. Oh, to Gary! And a Yuko! She's evened it up. It's all evens. Now it's anybody's match. And it just depends. Who wants it most? Oku coming forwards. Oh, so to Gary! Oh, she scores a Wazari, but her arms out. Her arms out straight. Has she made a mistake? Yes, she has. And the Germans have got it. She threw for Wazari on Ku. She got the score that she wanted. She thought it was all over, but then she fell into the arm lock. The arm was there, and look at that. Malsan takes the arm, straightens the arm, and gets the submission. Oku couldn't hold it off, and the Germans celebrate. What a win that was, and what a pressure point for Malsan. As Mongolia were left dejected, Germany were joined on the podium by Russia, 
who also secured a bronze medal. The final would see Japan take on the day's surprise package, Poland. Nakamura would once again lead from the front with an opening win, before Yamamoto secured a nice arm lock to force a submission from Podolak. After Toshiro had made sure the gold was in the bag, the final contest would see Yamabe looking to make every Japanese contest a 5-0 whitewash. Well, the Japanese have already won the title, but Yamabe comes out. Can she make it 5-0 in this particular contest? It's 5-0 every match that they've fought so far. And look at her setting her up now. She doesn't want to be there. Oh, what an open rumor that was. And even the Polish have had to turn their back. The Japanese celebrate. And it's 5-0 all the way. That was classical Okuruma. It really was. And the Japanese reign supreme. It's one thing winning the tournament, but winning 5-0 every match shows that the Japanese are back to their very best. Welcome back to the World Team Championships in Astana, where before the break, we saw the German women's team shatter Mongolia's hopes of a medal. Now it's the turn of the Mongolian men's team to see how they can fare. It's a team which is packed full of world stars, many of whom are household names, both at home and abroad, having won World Tour medals all across the globe. With such depth, Failure to bring home the goods would be a serious disappointment. The team includes one of the nation's most loved sons, Hashbatar, who in 2009 became their first world judo champion. But without doubt, the team's leader is former Olympic champion Naidan, whose story is perhaps the most poignant reminder of just what judo means to Mongolians back home. The backdrop to his gold medal triumph in Beijing was political unrest and bloodshed in the streets of Ulaanbaatar. For over a month, we had been having political riots in Mongolia. By the evening of the 14th of August, when I won my Olympic gold medal, there were mass celebrations throughout the country. People were hugging each other, kissing each other and congratulating each other. I understood at that moment how judo unified our people and unified our country. It's amazing how things changed because of my gold medal. Though Naidan's best years are behind him, his iconic status makes him someone that all young Mongolians look up to. The definition of a sporting hero. Here in Astana, the rest of the team were looking to gain the same notoriety when they took on Korea in the semi-finals. First up, world number two Davidorj took on the new world champion, Ann Bao. Despite Naidan's advice, Davidorj lost spectacularly and had to leave the mat knowing his team were behind. Defeat hard enough, but in the teams, it's not just yourself you've let down. Unfortunately, Ganbatar did no better. In just 11 seconds, he was thrown for Ippon by Ann Chang Grim. Mongolia were now 2-0 down. Their hopes of reaching the final were now hanging by a thread. After Otgonbatar was defeated by Lee, Mongolia's men were also gone from the hunt for gold, as Korea progressed to the final. Japan would be their opponents. In their opening bout, they demolished the hosts Kazakhstan. Triple world champion Ebenuma leading from the front and gaining a small measure of vindication for his failure to defend his title in the individual event. After Nagase won on the ground at under 81 kilograms, Yoshida was too powerful as he overthrew Yesen. A short while later, he showed more control and eventually finished his opponent on the deck. Another Japanese hold down for Ippon. All that was left was for Ojitani to complete the whitewash by defeating Shintia. Next up, Germany who refused to be intimidated as they took a 1-0 lead. Seidel throwing the lacklustre to Keiichi. A magic moment for German judo fans. But their joy would be short-lived, as Japan's next entry was a reigning world champion. 
in the form of Ono. And after he gave Wand a masterclass at under 73 kilograms, he handed over to his young teammate, Mariyama, who schooled Marish at under 81 kilograms with a beautiful Uchimata, an inner thigh throw. Ayuko from Yoshida against Hildebrand then decided the contest in the dying seconds as German hearts were broken. And Georgia were about to make Germany's day a whole lot worse as they defeated them in the bronze medal match to be on the podium for the third year running. Their new young star Gviniashvili was the man who sealed the deal for them with an Ippon against Hildebrand, who was once again the victim. Another solid performance from the Georgian judo powerhouses. As Japan came out to face Korea in the final, judo fans were in for a roller coaster ride. First, Ebenuma sent a message as he defeated Anne, the man who had taken his world title this year. Former world champion Nakaya would then square off against this year's bronze medalist, Anne Chang Grim, at under 73 kilograms. Wow, well, Song the coach. Stressed, he's a Shido down. He needs this to even it up, and he's the man on form in this competition, that's for sure. So now, what's gonna happen? Nakaya, oh, Nakaya's gonna go. Reverse in, Agi. Oh, he gets a Wazari. And well, for me, I thought he landed on his back. And so do the Koreans, I think. That was a brilliant technique. Nakaya couldn't stop it. The second stab rotates him over. And that was a brilliant reverse Sianagi. It's been changed to Ippon. It's Ippon and the Koreans go crazy. And that was brilliant stuff from this man on four man. Reverse Sianagi drives Nakaya over and it's 1-1. Korea versus Japan. What a final this is! With the scores level at one apiece, the pressure was on. But world champion Nagase was ready for the task and defeated Lee after a professional performance to make it 2-1 to Japan. Yoshida then had the sizeable task of beating Korea's newly crowned world champion at under 90 kilograms, Gwak. A task he was not equal to. As the Koreans' tactics were too much for him. Korea back in the game. And with things all square, the match would be decided in the very last contest, as Ojitani squared off against Kim Sung Min. With neither able to land the killer blow, Ojitani's efforts were awarded, with a penalty to Kim for inactivity. Japan were less than 30 seconds away from being crowned world champions once again. Well, sometimes it's about winning the match and it's tactical right to the end of this team competition. And Ojitani's got a hold off, 20 seconds to hold off. And Kim piling on the pressure. Oh, so close with that. Ojitani now trying to waste time. And the Koreans know it. And look at the stress on Anui's face there. And Ojitani just blocks out. He can't afford to drop. And look at Kim pushing forwards. And it's all over. That was as close as it's going to get. So, so close in the end. But Ojitani just holds off. There are tears in the crowd. And there is jubilation there in the Japanese dugout and the Koreans are absolutely mortified. It was so, so close, but sometimes it's about winning the match, and that's what the rules are all about. Playing the game, winning the match, and that's what Ojitani did. He won the match by the closest of margins, but in the end, it wins Japan, the world team title. Japan the champions for the second year in a row. But Korea came so, so close. For Mongolia, it was now or never as they came out to face off against home favorites, Kazakhstan in the bronze medal matchup. First out, Hashpatar against Yesim Betov. What a team this Mongolian team is. And look at the support there. Mongolian crowd loving this. 
The Mongolian style of wrestling, you can see the grips they take around the waist. Oh, that was brilliant. He hooked around the outside of the leg there and drove his opponent backwards. And look how he lands. He lands on his back. That hugging movement with the arms, so typical of the Mongolian style of fighting. Pulls him in, drives him over. A great start from Hashbitar. 1-0, Mongolia. After Ganbatar emerged victorious from the under 73 kilogram contest, Mongolia were up 2-0. Meaning Otgon Batar had the chance to win it for them in the under 81 kilo bout. Otgon Batar getting instructions then from Hashbatar. As to what to do, he has the sleeve now. Alkan Batar, is he going to turn in? Tries the sacrifice throw. Alkan Manuli on the retreat. This then for third place. Now he drops underneath him and he takes him over for a Yuko score and he's straight onto the neck. Alkan Batar trying to strangle his opponent now and he's won it for Mongolia. 3-0 Mongolia, they get the bronze medal. That was superb. The transition from standing down to ground was what it was all about. He turns in for a shoulder throw, right the way underneath his opponent, takes him onto his side for a Yuko score. The smallest score in judo, and then he follows it through with a strangle. Because he keeps his opponent on the ground, he goes underneath the neck with his left hand and secures the jacket and then he just needs to get leverage to put the strangle on. As soon as the strangle is on, he has to submit. And Kalka Manuli couldn't do anything about it. And Ogden Batar has won it for the Mongolians with two matches to spare. And the Mongolians can start celebrating their bronze medal. Lukagva Sjoren then made it 4-0 to Mongolia with two great left-handed Sianagis, shoulder throws, to dispatch Yesen. Former world champion Rakov then defeated Mongolia's talisman Naidan, who knew the result was already in the bag. A medal for Mongolia to take home to its adoring judo public after a thrilling team event here in Astana. Once again, team judo shows just how exciting it can be. Will these teams one day also be celebrating Olympic medals? Only time will tell. So that's it for now, but join us again as we follow French phenomenon Teddy Renaire on his quest for a record-breaking eighth world title.